Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. I'm really delighted to uh, be presenting with uh, my colleague Braden Ross this seventh installment of the Remote Teaching and Learning Analytics web series. Uh, I'm Dr. Mitch Culver and I'm an assistant professor in the School of Teacher Education and Leadership. I also manage the Center for Student Analytics where Braden works as a data scientist and Megan Lewis contributed to some of the slides in this deck. Our topic for today is using rubrics to optimize the grading experience. And I wanna get started by telling you a little bit about some student feedback that we received in spring semester shortly after the move to remote learning as a result of the global pandemic. Now, students in focus groups and also on a survey that went out had provided a lot of qualitative responses to this situation and their impressions about how well the remote learning experience was going for them. And so here's eight themes that kind of emerged or eight ideas that students kind of suggested that, that would help them to be more successful in the remote teaching environment. And one of the ones I wanna call out here, so you can see kind of clear and concise announcements from faculty, high quality lectures, really good peer interaction and discussions, course organization, assignment instructions, online skills development, flexibility in policies and then also office hours. But that fifth one, assignment instructions, was something that students talked about. And they talked about this idea that grading rubrics are sure helpful in, uh, especially in a situation where you're remote and you may not have as much access to ask questions of the faculty member regarding the assignments. So I wanna talk a little bit about using rubrics, whether you're using them in a traditional face-to-face -face environment or in a remote teaching environment. Rubrics are designed to give you systematic scoring to make the grading process more objective. And I think most people are familiar with, with the fact that rubrics are this way of systematizing the grading process. We know that uh, the research speaks to this idea that you, you develop criteria, that the conditions of performance that, that students must meet to be successful. And describing both strengths and errors. And then that is tied to some point values that allow you to very speedily kind of provide feedback to the students about the quality of their work. Now, we know from research that students who complete assignments with grading rubrics tend to score, or without grading rubrics in this case, tend to score significantly lower on average than students who completed the same assignments with the use of a rubric. And this is speaking to the idea that rubrics are a way of communicating expectations back and forth from the faculty member or the instructor to the student. And so we wanna talk about what we found. We, we know the research says that there's benefits for the students, but we also have looking at our learning analytics in the back end of Canvas, our learning management system, we wanna talk a little bit about some of the analytics that we've found that kind of support the idea of use of rubrics. Now, I wanna make a disclaimer. Some people are probably listening to this and going, oh no, rubrics, here we go again. There are instructors who very intentionally do not use rubrics. They don't like them. They have really good reasons for not liking them. And we're not trying to come up against those, those faculty members in any way, shape or form. We, we are supportive of the approaches that faculty like to use in their classes, but for those who are either using rubrics or are open to using rubrics, this is kind of what this webinar is about. So there is this resource and these slides will be available. We'll link to them below kind of uh, wherever we post this webinar on YouTube. But this link here is a, a rubric development handout that I wanted you to have access to. You could also quickly write this down or pause the video and write this down or type it in. And, and this is, if you've never developed a rubric before, this is kind of 101. We're not gonna teach you how to develop a rubric, but, but if you were interested, there are a lot of resources online. This is one that I found particularly useful. So I'm gonna turn the time over to Braden now, uh, and he's gonna walk us through some analytics uh, from USU's own data about the use of rubrics. Thanks, Mitchell. So just like Mitchell said, we were able to obtain some data from Utah State's uh, data source for online teaching and learning, which is Canvas. Uh, it's a learning management system I'm sure many of you in the education space are familiar with. And so just to paint the picture kind of of what this experiment and this analysis looked like, like I said, we took data from our own course system and we collected over 2,000 courses over two semesters and 11,000 grading instances. So a grading instance being an instructor types in a grade for a given assignment for a specific student, and then they 
post that grade. So that's a grading instance. And what we did was we broke the data into two categories, rubric users and non-rubric users. And right off the bat, we found something quite interesting from just breaking down that uh, demographic, which was there's only about 10% of the total grading instances who fall under uh, in, uh, instructors who use rubrics for their assignments. And 90% of those instructors in those assignments were non-rubric users. So that's already a, a, a key insight for us at Utah State. And we'll talk a little bit more why that's important later on. And the key insight and the key factor that we were looking at here was time between grades. And what that gives us the ability to uh, kind of look at and analyze is, is you know, how long between assignments are instructors spending? So if they're sitting down and doing a lot of grading really quickly, are they taking a long time to grade between assignments or are they taking a short time? That can really give us some insight for those rubric users as to what effects the rubric is having on their ability to grade quickly. So just to give you an example before we dive into the, any of the data so you can really have a clear image of what this looks like in your head, an example would be an instructor sits down and grades the first assignment of the evening at 11.03 p.m. They finish grading and then they finish the second assignment at 11.05 p.m. The time between grades is then two minutes. So that's the number that we're looking at right there. So now you've got that in your, in your head. You can kind of see what we were looking at here and we found some interesting results. So on the next slide here, you'll see that there's this concentration and kind of this bar chart of where those average grade times fell for their, the courses that we were looking at. Keep in mind, again, these are about 11,000 or grading instances, excuse me, that we were taking into account looking at. And you'll notice that, you know, in the blue, there's the rubric users, like we said, about 10% of the total courses fall under that category, and then non rubric users. And on the right hand side there, you see that those two averages for those uh, groups are different. It's only about a minute and a half for rubric users between assignment grading and closer to two minutes for non-rubric users. And I want to take your attention to the top of the graph. It says zero to 30 minutes. And what that means is we took the data and we subsetted it down to, you know, people who were speed graders, if you will, people who were taking uh, relatively short amounts of time between grades, you know, people who were spending some probably set amount of times sitting down grading, maybe you as an instructor have a specific day or time of week that you like to do grades. And what we wanted to do was make sure we were capturing those instructors to really get a clear idea of what effects rubrics were having. And so what we did then at that point was we thought, okay, well, you know, if someone's just going through and grading things really quickly, which we can see, lots of the observations fall under a minute between grades. So that could be things like very routine assignments. Uh, maybe it's a get to know you activity. Maybe it's, you know, something that doesn't require a lot of thought that the instructor can see, oh, they answered all the questions. It was a participation assignment. So in order to get an even better idea of that clear effect and what we could see, we removed all of those observations that were below a minute. So this next graph you'll see changes a little bit. And when we remove all of the uh, grading instances below a minute between grades, then we start to get an idea of that picture. And, and obviously you can see if you look back to those average grade times for the rubric and non-rubric users, five minutes on average between grades for instructors who are using rubrics and six and a half minutes. So there we're seeing the effect a lot more clearly than we were in the previous figure. We can see that there's a minute and a half difference when instructors use rubrics versus when they don't. So this is incredibly powerful for us to see visually, but this next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, is that actually happening underneath the surface? As data scientists, that's our job to, you know, determine is it actually an effect or does it just look like that? Is it significant? So, like I said, lots of great things we gather from, you know, those initial insights, almost a one to seven ratio between rubric users and non-rubric users. And like I said, for 
most people, the average grade time was less than a minute between grades, which, I mean, if we're talking about grading, that's a pretty good time period. We like to see grades, you know, enter quickly so students can get good feedback. And we ended up using statistical tests to determine significance and effect size, and it was significant at the highest level. So as a data scientist, when you're looking at something like this and you're doing an analytics project, that's what you love to see. You know, it really tells us that there is an effect going on here. There is a correlation between using rubrics and shorter grade times between assignments. So, you know, as instructors, you guys can use that in your, you know, practices and it has really great effects. Just to give you a quick example on the next slide, it will save you if you're, you know, let's say in a class of 70 students teaching and you have 30, 30 assignments over the course of a semester, that's five and a half hours of total grade time saved just by using rubrics with the effect size that we've shown here to be significant. So, you know, as Dr. Mitch Culver puts it, it that's, uh, that's well worth, you know, three Star Wars movies or you know, any other amount of time you want to spend doing anything else. That's five and a half extra hours to use that you're saving by uh, implementing rubrics in your grading strategy. So finally, just before I leave, all right, send it back to uh, Dr. Culver. I want to talk real quick about some of the short and long-term effects that these grade times can have. So on the next slide here, we have done other analyses into the relationship between uh, grade times and things that affect students long term, such as persistence, uh, evaluation scores, uh, and many other different metrics. And what we've shown is that grade time actually affects students' likelihood of persistence uh, at a university. So, you know, not only in the short term are we seeing these great effects with instructors being able to save time grading, students getting quicker feedback, but it actually impacts the student long term during their tenure at a university or higher education institution. If they're getting quicker feedback, they're much more likely to remain at that institution. And we've done lots more analyses uh, that you can see in this web series or other ones that we've done. Uh, relating to that. So we we're very excited to find these effects and uh, definitely excited to give instructors an idea of how they can save some time on grading. Thanks so much, Braden. I really appreciate you sharing all that. And for the remainder of the webinar, I thought it would be useful just to talk through my own experience using rubrics as an instructor. And, and so you understand, I didn't always, um, I didn't always like rubrics. I didn't always use rubrics. I didn't use rubrics for the first six years that I was teaching. In the first place, um, uh, this, this created a problem of subjective expectations. My students, when you don't use a rubric, there's always these changing, you know, is it going to be good enough and how will I know it's good enough? The students feel that way. You also, as a, as a grader, there is somewhat of an arbitrary feel as you're, you're going through and saying, okay, what is this score? This seems pretty good and I'm not sure and how many points should I give and how many points should I take off? And so I didn't like that, but I didn't really want to buckle down and make the change. And, and just like Braden had said, there, there, um, there's only 10% of, of, of the population at Utah State using rubrics, whereas 90% or a one to seven ratio of users, but 10% of grades given are not rubric, or are rubric oriented, whereas 90% aren't. And so I think there is a general hesitancy uh, um, amongst academics to use rubrics. And for me, not using a rubric, it also made me hesitant to be honest and harsh in my grading and to give really accurate grades, really honest grades, really even um, what you'd think of as a punitive grade. But if the work was poor quality, I, I would always hesitate, like, well, how much of a bad grade can I give? And so I think this led to a little bit of grade inflation. I also think it was um, a situation where I didn't always know how to explain the grades very well. I would take points off and say, I took this many points off for this much stuff but it, I didn't always feel like it was even. And so there was this lack of formative feedback given to the students. And I think overall it was leading to a less rigorous experience. Well, in, in um, the process of my teaching career, I, I inherited a class that came with rubrics and I was not excited. I kind of was like, oh no, rubrics, I, I, don't, I don't like this. Like it, I feel like I'm gonna be boxed in by it. And, and, and in fact, the rubrics I inherited, they, they did feel overbuilt. I, there was too many components and I, I felt like they were a little bit um, 
ticky tacky uh, to, to put it in a, in a kind of uh, uh, just, I mean, I just felt like I couldn't, I couldn't really get into them. And then also I would, the rubric is there, but the students would ignore the rubric. And so then when they would submit an assignment that didn't align with the rubric, I was having to do mental gymnastics to try to find like, where do they think that they're fulfilling this element of the rubric? Cause I don't see it. And so it was this messing grading pro process and it felt really stringent. And so what I realized is that uh, I felt like the assignment did need a rubric and that I just needed to adapt that rubric and integrate it into my style of teaching. And so now I love rubrics. I, I did that. And the first thing is I had to remix it to fit my grading style. So what had been very, um, ornate in terms of a rubric, I reduced it down to the elements that I felt were most essential. And I combined a lot of items into kind of more paragraph style, but that's because it's my style that, that that's, I felt like it was appropriate to do that. And then I also created an assignment template that kind of helped students to see this is this beginning part of the paper is where I expect you to, to do this part of the rubric, right? So, so like this is the template of this personal narrative. And then each of the five elements kind of grouped together here match what is on the template. So if the student uses the template, then I know where are, where do they think that they're filling this in while well, they think it's immediately after this prompt, right? And then I use kind of this mastery approach of, of zero to three points, right? So mastery three points are very much like what I'm seeing. Two points is I see that you're trying here, but it's approaching. One point is I don't know what you're doing. This is inadequate. And then zero points is you just didn't even put it in. And the nice thing about rubrics is when you give the rubric score in Canvas, it allows you to put a, a verbal comment. And it's so easy for me to go through and as, as their mastery, you know, good job or whatever, but approaching adequate or not present, it's very easy for me to describe to the student, um, hey, I don't see this or this is inadequate and here's why. Uh, look at what the prompt says. Yours only fulfills a couple of those elements. This is inadequate. I'd like you to take a look again. And what that led is, is to is what I started noticing is, is when students were getting 99, 100%, I was spending less than two minutes grading because I could go through very quickly and see, oh yeah, this is mastery, this is mastery, mastery. And what I noticed is that when the grades would get closer to 75, 60%, I was spending a lot more time grading because it was, I'm entering all these feedback comments. And I started to think, I, I bet this is speeding up my grade time, my grading process, because it is when students follow the template and they follow the rubric, it's very clear to see that they've done the work. And, and I was very enthused about that. Um, and it made me confident in awarding the honest grade. So when I was giving students, you know, 50 points off a 200 point assignment, so they're getting a 75 or giving 100 points off, you know, they're only getting a 50%. I knew how to defend that. I said, yeah, it doesn't match the rubric at all. And you, you're either going to have to redo this or or that's the grade you're gonna get. And that helped shape a uh, formative resubmission process, right? So I, I always do this with my students to say, hey, you haven't quite, quite got there yet. You can earn back a portion of the points I do. Whatever the points you lost, you can earn back 60% of them if you would revisit and resubmit. Some students take that opportunity and others don't. But overall, I've been very pleased. Now there is some disclaimers that I wanna just provide here. I don't use rubrics on every single one of my assignments. And I know that there are faculty who choose very intentionally not to use rubrics because they have a pedagogy and a very uh, intentional, optimized approach to their teaching that they don't want to change or mess with. But I see a lot of faculty not using rubrics just because they don't know how or because they haven't tried. Or, and this is what we're trying to kind of help you to see that we know overall rubrics are in fact beneficial to students in helping them understand the expectations of an assignment. And they do perform, as that research showed, they on average are more likely to get a higher grade on assignments where a rubric is present. For you as a grader, from my own experience, I think you'll, you'll find that it speeds your grading process, but it also makes you more confident in the grades that you give and does in fact create a more rigorous experience. And so I think there's benefits all around. Uh, this is the seventh uh, video in a, a web series that we've been doing. And so I wanted to provide that link in case you wanted to go and watch the other six videos. And then I think there'll be three more after this that we'll publish. But we really appreciate you being here. You can always reach out to us at the Center for Student Analytics. Uh, if you have questions, if you have feedback about this series, about any of the work that we do, we'd really love to hear that. So reach out by email. We really thank you for watching this webinar and we hope that you have a good day and uh, a good uh, preparation for fall semester. Thanks so much for being here.